just raise your hand. Ma'am, what's your name? Elsie Gonzalez, I thank you for being here with us. I pray that you Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Rebecca, you have a friend that has been here for the first time. welcome. I pray that you feel welcome in this place. Anybody else? I always say this, if you've been here two or three times, that's in your family. You're one of us. Is, is over in the children's court. He's in the youth chapel with the children's church and they're doing their own praise and worship, kind of like what we're doing here. So I'm going to ask two things. Number one, that he would keep them in prayer. That God would move in their lives and that those children would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior yeah. at that age. Because the Bible says that if you teach a child in the way that they should go, when they grow older, they will not turn from it. Amen. So we're going to count on that word. Pastor Rowe has asked us for just a split second if we would recognize those people who have birthdays in July. If you have a birthday in July, would you please come up here? Rebecca, you need to get up here. Georgie, you need to get up here. Preacher's kids, right? God, we gotta, we gotta. <laughs> I mean, I wonder if you're July 20th? All right. Is there anybody else? Nayeli, would you come up here, please? Oh, she went to class? Okay, never mind. We're going to get somebody else to help us. Um, would you all please just extend your right hand? We're going to pray a blessing. Is there anybody else that has a birthday? We're not here to embarrass you. We just want to bless you. We want you to make you feel special. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, and I pray that you would bless each of these young ladies, Father God, on the, on the month of their birthday. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would bless them and that you would be with them wherever they may go, and that you would get, show them your favor. With them, as a church family, we, we celebrate this time, and we celebrate this moment, and we thank you for giving them another year of life, and we pray in the name of your son Jesus that you would bless them, and that you would be with them all the rest of the days of their life, and that they would honor you and glorify you by the way that they live their lives and by what they do. I pray that they would always be led by you and directed and guided by you. Shape them and mold them and cause them to be who you created them to be. Women, mighty women of God, we speak and we pray over their lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Now would you join me in singing? Happy, Happy birthday.
The title of today's message is A Father's Love. And right there while you're standing, we're going to read uh, uh, some scriptures out of the Bible. And we are going to pray and then I'll have them take a seat. Thank you all very much. God bless you. The title of today's message is A Father's Love. And it, it's, it's taken out of Luke. Now, I need to kind of, kind of give you a backdrop. This message has been on my heart since Father, Father's Day weekend. And I find it interesting because the preachers who came up here and preached, they never saw the notes that I was writing or what I was taking down. But yet, it seemed to be consistent with what God was showing me. Luke chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 13. I'm reading out the New King James Version. And they will put a version up there for you. And it says this. It says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions on powerful living. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. Lord, I, I pray in the name of your son Jesus that you would anoint me to speak and preach and teach your word. And that you would anoint the ears and the hearts of the men and women that are in this place and that they would be able to receive, that their hearts and their ears and their spirits and their souls would be fertile ground, ready to receive the word that you have for them, not the word that I have for them. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would open up our understanding and that we would see this text through a fresh and new perspective. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would have your way. You're, you're here already. Now I pray that you would begin to peel back the layers and Father, by the end of this service and by the end of this message, that people would make a conscious decision to give their lives to you and to follow you with everything that they are and everything that they've got. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. Man, have I got a word for somebody this morning. If you are here, I want you to know that this word is for you. And the reason why I say that is because, like I told you, since before Father's Day, God has been stirring this word in my heart. And I've tried to work on other messages, and it didn't happen. And as you all know, the last few weeks I haven't preached here. But God has been stirring this word. And every time that I start looking up other scriptures or other texts, God will bring me back to this word here. And what I'm realizing is that it's because there is somebody that has an appointment today. And a, a divine appointment. And I want you to know that. Your Heavenly Father loves you Amen. so very much. He loves you so much. And the most important thing, as far as Hebrew culture and Hebrew tradition goes, the most important thing that a father could do is bless his children. Amen. Now, I'm not excluding the, the women by any means, but I want you to understand that the way the Bible is written, the most important thing that a father could do was bless his children. You don't believe me, go to the text. And what you'll see is you'll see people like Jacob and Israel. At the time that they were, the Bible says that while they were getting ready to die, they would actually stop death and they would hold death at bay. And they would pause for just a moment and they would say, hold on a second, death. I'm not ready yet. I've got to bless my children before I go. Sweetheart, would you come back up here? I'm going to need you to do something for us. A father has the ability and he has the authority and he has the honor and he has the privilege and he has the duty to speak into his child's destiny. Jacob, or Israel, whichever one you want to use, at the hour of his death, he began to bless and curse. He began to pronounce blessings and cursings on each one of his children. He knew how important it was to speak into their destiny. He knew that when he spoke, that something would come to life and that they would become who he said that they would become. And I tell you that for this reason. Don't ever tell your children that they're losers or that they're dumb or that they're or that they can't do it. You believe in them when even when no one else can Amen. believe in them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If your child was missing or if they are or they were lost, how many of you would go out and try to find them and try to look for them? I don't care how old my children get, they will always be my babies. Amen. And my question for you this morning is what would you do? If one of your kids was in trouble, and how far would you go for them if they got in trouble? I believe that there are certain parents, mothers and fathers, who would probably fight for their children even if their child was wrong. I've seen it. Not to say that you won't say, well, it's not Nemo's fault. You'll actually be like, you know what it is, his fault, you shouldn't have done it, but you don't talk to my child like that. 
You don't treat my child like that. Anybody in here ever have a good kid? And then, and then, and then one that kind of got on your nerves, you know what I mean? We sent them all away so we could be honest with each other. Amen? I, I said this last night, we were fellowshipping, and I said, man, God knew what he was doing when he gave us Georgie first. Because we were ready to have 10 children after that. If God had given us Hannah first, she would have been a normal child. And not because she's bad, she, the doctors say she's brilliant, and she really is, but she questions everything. And that's actually an attribute that I appreciate, I like. I just don't like it when she does it with me. <laughs> she can do it with everybody else, just don't do it with me. You know, I even hear my wife sometimes say, because I said so, that's why. You know what I mean? Well, I'm your parent, now, that's why. I'm talking about a kid like this one. Maybe we just show that, that picture. We need to ask you to put up your hands here. <laughs> one of your kids seems like they were almost sent from heaven. It was like God said, anyone I'm going to bless you with this one right here. And then there's that other one. <laughs> the one that smells bad. <laughs> the room's always dirty. They never listen. They always date the wrong ones. The one that's on your constant prayer list, you know what you're talking about? The one that you, even, even when you don't believe it, you, you trust God enough to say, you know what, Lord, I know you're going to do something. You know, my daughter, I'll tell you about my daughter, Hannah. I have children that, that are leaders, and I realize that, not because they're my children, not because I'm playing favorites, but I realize that Hannah, as stubborn as she is, she's a world changer. She's not a game changer, she's a world changer. That's why she asks so many questions. That's why it's so hard for her and I. You know, she's the child that I tell her, don't do that or you're going to get burned. It's like she can't help it. She'll look at me and she'll be like this. I'll say, Hannah, don't touch that because it's going to burn you. She'll be like, and it's almost like she's looking at me like, Dad, I'm sorry, I can't help it. And then she'll touch it and I'll be like, what did I tell you? But it's, she's one of those kids that has to find out for themselves. Like that kid right there. You see him, the third one. They gotta figure it out for themselves. You can say, you know what, don't eat that fish, it tastes gross. You can get a coli or Ebola or whatever, and they'll still throw it on them. But here's my question to you, regardless of where your children are, at what point do you give up on them? And at what point do you throw in the towel? As a parent, we should never give up on our children. And we should never give up on, on or we should never throw it away. A father's love is the love that I perceive even when you're not looking for it. If you were to have a child that was sick, how long would you fight for them? Yeah. Or how long would you say, you know what, it's time to let them go, it's time to give them up? Because what I've learned is that most parents, they'll keep fighting. And the story that we opened up with, it's, it's called the story of the prodigal son. I really don't care for that game. I wish that I could write a letter to the institution and ask them to change the name. Because these words that I opened up with, it's Jesus song. And if you listen closely to what he said, especially in the New King James Version, he doesn't say that the son was prodigal. He says that the way that he was living was prodigal. Actually, the words are, the son wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Jesus recognized that it wasn't the son who was prodigal, but it was the way that he was living that was prodigal. In other words, you don't have to be what you're doing even now when you belong to God. You see, all of us struggle, and all of us fall short, according to Scripture. But you don't have to identify yourself with that person or, or, or with that addiction or with that bondage or whatever the case is. And I know that there are people who would love to keep you bound and they would love to keep you ashamed and they would love to be for you to be the worst version of yourself. But this morning I came to serve notice and I came to declare in your life and I came to tell you that the blood of Jesus says that you're the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. It means you don't have to be what you've been doing. You don't have to do, you don't have to be what, what other people say that you are. So the things that you do, they may not be who God intended you to be. The things that you do may not be who you are. You ever be that person? Have you ever been that person that says, you know what? Why do I do that? I hate when I do that. I hate when I lose my temper and I go off. You know, this week alone, God has been showing me with my children. I'll get out of them. Because let's say they, they let's say they eat something in the truck and they stain the furniture on the truck. And in reality, the truck is the worst investment that anybody or a vehicle, an automobile, is.
is the worst investment that anybody can make. Why am I getting so upset? Because in reality, if one of my children were to get sick and die, does it really matter what happened to that seed? And the answer is no. That's a material thing. Amen. And don't get me wrong, yeah, we want to take care of our stuff. And I, I found myself saying that. The other day we went to the movies and the, my mother-in-law called my wife and said, hey, the dog ate up one of the remotes and I got upset. I said, man, we can never have anything nice. Our kids don't take care of anything. And then we get home and it was a wrong remote. It was one that was already chewed up. <laughs> and I'm telling you, God, in that moment, showed me that I can see you more worried about this other stuff. All that other stuff is replaceable. But the child that I assigned to you, the child that I gave you, they are not replaceable. You are a child of God. And don't let the devil lie to you. You need your own And what I'm learning about being a child of God is that you can be a child of God and you can still mess up at times. Amen. My children, they act bad sometimes and sometimes they disobey me and sometimes they mess up, but that doesn't mean that they're no longer my children. Amen. They are still my children. When your kids, when they do something that you ask them not to do, are they no longer your children? No, I don't think so. Now, in that moment, you might wish that they weren't your children, right? Like when they do good, man, those are my kids, right? That's my baby. That's my kid. That, that kid gets that from our side. <laughs> they mess up, they get that from their mom's side. <laughs> that babe, I forgot you were speaking the same thing. Or I'll address my wife and I'll say, hey, you know what your kid just said? You want to know what your kid did? Because my kids don't do that. Right? Obviously they got it from your side. You didn't pray against those curses. <laughs> or whatever the case is. But God doesn't do that with any of us. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how we act. We are still our child's. We are still our parents' children. And the truth is that many of them are just acting the way that they've been taught by us. You know, my mommy said, say a saying. And it was a, it was, she said it in, in jest and in humor. She would say, do as I say, not as I do. And many of us, we live by that. We'll tell our kid. It's okay for me to do it because I'm the grown up. But what I'm learning about when it comes to God, when we apply this principle to our relationship with God, your, your behavior doesn't change your family. Your behavior doesn't change who you belong to. My mama is still my mama no matter what I do. My children are still my children no matter what they do. How many of you know that you're a child of God even when you don't make the best decisions? And sometimes we make decisions because of selfish reasons. And there's a lot of people, I'm talking about a lot of believers who struggle with the idea that God could love you right where you're at right now. That God could love you just the way that you are. There are some people who believe that God could never pursue them and that God could never want them because of the things that they've done. There are people who walk into churches all around the world and they're filled with shame and they're filled with guilt and they're filled with condemnation because they're sinners. And the truth of the matter is, is that we're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. And even though you don't always make the right decision, it does not mean that you're still a child of God. And I want to I want to cancel out that lie this morning in the name of Jesus. There are most people in this room and the people who are watching us by social media who they struggle with the idea that God loves you just the way that you are. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible says to be ye holy, for I am holy. And I believe this, that if you truly give your life to Christ, I'm talking about really surrender. I'm talking about giving up your life to Christ. And you make it up your mind to never quit and to never give up and to never give in, eventually that change will come. And there are a lot of people who struggle with addictions. And there are a lot of people who struggle with, with different things. And they don't know why they're bound to the things that they're bound to. And then they struggle with saying, well, am I a child of God or am I a child of the devil? And there are people who think that, that God could never pursue them because of the things they, that they've done. And unfortunately, there's a lot of schools of thought out there who have messed up our minds. There's a lot of doctrines out there that have messed up our way of thinking. And the reality is, is that there are people that are waiting. I talk to them all the time. And they'll say things like, I can't go into your church, George, because the walls will fall down. They're walking around just waiting for God to strike them down because of the things that they've done and because they're sinners. And I want you to know, and I want to serve notice this morning, that if God really wanted to kill you for being a sinner, he would have done it a long time ago. And the fact of it is, and the truth of it is, is that God is extending his amazing grace and his mercy so that you can repent 
and turn from your wicked ways and so that you can repent and turn from your sins and run back to the And I would suggest that you do that today. In actuality, I would go as far as to say that God has probably been fighting in the spiritual realm to keep you alive even when you try to kill yourself with the decisions that you make Amen. or the relationships that you enter. If you don't believe me, read if you don't believe me, read the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, the Bible talks about how there were angels who showed up. The angel Gabriel shows up and he tells Daniel, hey, I'm sorry it took me so long. We were fighting. And I'm going to paraphrase it. He basically says, we were fighting in the spiritual world for the last 21 days on your behalf. How many angels has it taken to keep you alive from the decisions that you've made and the relationships that you've gotten into? Answer, tell them to come to church. <laughs> tell them it's getting good. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> tell them it's been a few weeks since I've been to That's an alarm. Go sign for somebody to wake up. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. What would happen if one of your kids came to you and they decided that they no longer wanted to be your child? And they say, you know what, I don't want to be your kid anymore. Because that's what, that's what a lot of believers do to God when we get upset and we don't get our way. A lot of times we'll come up to God and be like, you know what, that's it, this relationship's over. But what I've learned is that when you belong to God, He don't let you go without a fight. Amen. He don't let you go without a fight. You want to know what would happen? And one of my kids came up to me and they said, Dad, I want a divorce and I want you to be my dad. <laughs> Nothing would happen. They don't have the ability or the capability to be able to do that, to say that they're not mine. They can't erase the fact that they belong to us, to my wife and I, because they came from our laws. It don't matter how, how bad they don't want to look like you, some of them still look like you. Oh. Right? And they hate it because every time they look in the mirror, it's a constant reminder. And they get to a certain age where they think they know everything that you can't tell them anything. You don't know any better. And I believe that God is running after somebody in this room and he's been running after you for a long time because you belong to him. And it doesn't matter how far you run or how hard you run away from him. You know in your heart that you belong to him. And the Bible says that the prodigal son went to his father and he wanted his inheritance. That's what we opened up with. You got to understand the level of disrespect that it is to go to your father or your parent that's still alive and say, why wait till you're dead? Give me what's mine right now. It's kind of like saying, I wish you were dead already. Or you're as good as dead to me. And yet the father, he still just gave him and divided up the inheritance and gave it to him lovingly. And the Bible says that this son went crazy, squandering it all is the word that he uses. And then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of a foreign country. And Jesus said this word to people who were listening. And I believe that there's a very profound message that many of us miss. You see, sin is a foreign city to the believer. When you don't belong to that thing, it's a foreign city to you and I. And when you belong to Jesus, there are things that you'll try to do and there'll, there'll be things that everybody else is enjoying that you can't enjoy because you're a child of God. And a sinner is a slave in that foreign country. And sin wants you to stay bound. And it promises things that it cannot provide. And sin tells you that to take pleasure without any kind of consequence. Sin will tell you that there's no responsibility for your actions. Sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, and it'll keep you there longer than you ever wanted to stay. As a matter of fact, sin will take you in the opposite direction of the destiny that God has for you. Yes, yes, yes. That's what sin does. That's why it's so important to stay connected and to stay close to the Father. Don't leave His presence. Don't leave where we're at right now. Don't leave the presence of God. Stay connected to God. Stay connected to the church. Stay connected to godly people. Don't go off on your own. There are so many people who they can't receive instruction from anybody else because as far as they're concerned, they can only hear from God. And the reality of it is, is that God sets it up a certain way so that we can be here for one another. None of us is made to do this on our own. We are in this together. That's why it's so important to get involved in the events and the ministries that we offer here at the church. Because we want you to stay connected, not just to us, but to the Father. It's not a form of control like some other churches do it. Just being real, when I throw that out there. 
It's not a form of control. It's about keeping you and staying connected to the Father. Stop lending your time and your family to a world that does not love them and will not love them. Start introducing them and connecting them here at the church and start connecting them to the body of Christ and start connecting them to God. Don't be playing games with the devil. And the Bible goes on to say this. It says, but, and it's talking about the son, the wayward son, the prodigal son. It says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and despair, and I perish with, with hunger? In other words, he came to his senses. He said, my father has servants that are living better than what I'm living right now. And so the Bible goes on to tell us that he repented and he turned back to the father. He repented and he turned from his wicked sin. He repented and he turned from his wicked ways. And he went to his father and he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. You see that, my friends, is accepting responsibility for his part in you. If I could be as transparent to tell you this. If you want to beat that sin, you want to beat that addiction, you want to beat whatever it is that you're bound to, take responsibility for your part in it. Don't sit there and say that the devil made you do it every time that you do it. Accept responsibility, walk with honor, and walk with integrity, and have some character, and say, this is mine, and I'll own up to it, and I'll take a step to get away from it. Because if you fall, and if you fail, and if you mess up, you need to ask God to forgive you, and you need to fight for your family, and you need to keep moving <coughs> to the Lord. We don't quit, and we don't give up. Christians do not quit, and we do not give up. That's how we belong to Jesus. You need to find a church, and you need to find some people who will love you, and who will hold you accountable, and they'll love you enough to be honest with you. The Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And basically what it means, and what it translates to, is that I will tell you the truth even if it hurts your feelings, because I love you that much. But an enemy will tell you what you want to hear, just so that they can get what they want out of you. And the devil is a liar. We all need each other, and I'm tired of the devil dividing us up and separating us and picking us off one by one. Satan will always attack the isolated prey first. Why? Because they have no support system, and because they have no one to turn to, and because they're all in it by themselves. And so the enemy will constantly attack those people, and we are in this together. We need to make a covenant that we'll always pray for each other, and that we'll always cover each other, and that we'll always have each other's back, and that we'll always lift each other up, and that we'll always build each other up, and that we'll always encourage each other, and that we'll fight for one another, regardless of what it costs. Yes. That's, you want, to, you want the church to grow as a community? That's how you do it. We stand in the gap for one another, and we be there for each other whenever we have a need, and whenever, we, we're, whenever we're going through something, and we pray for one another. Yeah. None of us are supposed to do it on our own. And so the Bible says, where we left off, is that the prodigal son went back to the father. Man, I really wish that we could change the name from the prodigal son to the love of the father. Because you really, you, you have to fully understand. In order to get this story, you've got to fully understand the perspective of the father. Anybody in here ever been disconnected from your parent or from a child? Where perhaps y'all didn't talk for a little while? You know what I'm talking about? I've done it with both parents and my children, if I can be honest. A few months back, Rebecca had done something. It was something that I asked her not to do. I forget what it is now. That's how important it was. But I was upset, and I got after her, and she stood up for what she believed in. And we had an argument. And at the end of the argument, we didn't talk, I don't know, a day, two, maybe three days. But all the while, I still worried about her because she's my baby. All the while, I still wanted to check up on her secretly, just to make sure that she was okay. I would tell my other kids, go, go call your sister down and come to eat. She, she, she resides upstairs. And I would tell my other children, go, go call your sister and make sure she ate. Just in case she hadn't eaten, I wanted to make sure that she ate because I'm still her daddy and I still love her. I wanted her to know that she still had a seat at our table. Because she was still a part of the family, even if we didn't see eye to eye, even if we didn't agree. You see, I believe that the love of the father is what kept him looking for that prodigal son to come back one day. And I believe that perhaps the other son would go to his father and tell him, why are you still doing these things for a son that doesn't love you? 
And the answer for every parent is, is because he or she is still my child. He or she will always be my baby. I've heard people tell other parents whenever their parent, whenever their children have gone wayward, or whenever they get in trouble with the law, or whenever they're up to no good, or whenever they're bound or addicted to drugs, I've heard people tell other parents, just forget about your kid. And the truth is, is that that will never happen. Especially when you're when you when they belong to you and they're your children and you've spent time up at night praying for them because they were sick or because they were out and about. You know, when my kids go out, I can't go to sleep until they get home. I can't lock up the doors until they get home. Georgie will sometimes work till one or two in the morning and I'll stay up waiting for him because I want to make sure that he gets home safely because I can't sleep otherwise. I go and I got to check all the locks and I got to do everything. And so whenever you spend time acting like that with your child or crying for them or caring for them or feeding them or you bathe them when they were little. There is a love inside of you that still wants the best for them. There is still a seat saved for them inside the table of your heart. And God still feels the same way if not more about you. And God still has a seat saved for you at the table. He has a seat saved for you at the table of his heart. And Jesus left his seat at the table of the Father, and he left the throne room of heaven, and he came down here to live among us, and to be one of us, and then he died for our sins, so that you and I could have a seat at the Father's table, I'm telling you that there is a God who loves you that much, that he sent his one and only son to die for you, so here's the question this morning, what if you had a kid, one good kid, and a bunch of bad kids, and the only way that you could save the bad kids, was by sacrificing the good ones? Some of you might be thinking, well, which kid? <laughs> well, that's exactly what God did for you. He sacrifices one good kid for all the rest of us. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God loves you that much. Amen. God loves you that much. <laughs> God has been pursuing his children since the beginning of time. You have a father who loves you and adores you, and yet you still struggle to worship him. You still struggle to raise your hands in worship. As a matter of fact, there are some people who think that worship is boring. My mom did a post this week, or she posted a meme this week, and I really enjoyed it. It was by Francis Chan, and it basically said that somebody went up to Pastor Francis Chan, he's a pastor in California, and they told him, Pastor, I really didn't have to worship this morning. Pastor Francis said, this chant said, well, good, because we didn't come here to worship you. <laughs> we didn't worship you. Amen? <laughs> we have people who will try to sneak out of every service early just a little bit, but yet you'll stay at the movie theater until the closing credits until the lights go. <laughs> I know, I've been there, I've seen some of you. <laughs> I stayed there with you. So here's the question, how long? How long do you think that God should fight for you and I? Because you and I, we've messed up. We've sinned and we've done wrong and we've failed and we've come up short. And yet God is still pursuing you and he's still, he's still after you. He's still seeking a relationship with you. And we need to thank God because we don't deserve the love or the grace or the mercy or the forgiveness that he has extended to us. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for you and I. Amen. You see, he didn't wait for you to get it right. You'll hear people say that you need to get your life right and you need to come to church. And the reality of it is, is that you need to come to Jesus and let him get your life right. He'll take care of the rest. You just come and surrender your life to him. Amen. And churches don't tell you things like that anymore for these days. And God even died for the ungodly too. I mean, Jesus even died for the ungodly too. Amen. Don't let anybody tell you. I've heard people say it. I've heard people say it to my face. That that guy right there that just came into the back doors, he's a sinner. Well, who do you think Jesus came for? Yeah. Even Jesus himself said, if you're not sick, you don't need a doctor. Chaplain, Chaplain David said it earlier when we prayed before this service. He said, you know what? This is a, this is a hospital. For those that are spiritually sick, and I totally agree with you. This is the emergency room for those of you who are spiritually, physically, and emotionally sick. And we have the physician of all physicians, the surgeon of all surgeons, 
who can heal you and set you free this morning. Somebody needs to come back to their seat at the Father's table this morning. Everybody needs a Savior. Everybody needs to get saved. And we need to fight for every soul and not just let them perish and go to hell on their own. We need to fight for them and say, you know what? You belong to Jesus. And let me remind you that you're his child and he loves you. And we don't just go after the ones that we think or the ones that we like. We go after everybody. Yeah. And so the Bible goes on to say this. When it's referring to the son, it says, when he was still a great way off, talking about the son, the father saw him and had compassion and he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Now, I can imagine before this took place, okay, because a lot of preachers will preach the sermon, they preach it all the time, but I can imagine the father every day as somebody would walk by the property or camel by them, because they didn't have vehicles back then, right? So, Who's buying his camel or horse or whatever? I bet he would be like, is that, is that my baby? Is that my son? Could that be? Could today be that day? No way, it can't be. And then when the day it happened, the father didn't just sit there and wait and say, you see, that's what he got. I told him that he was going to run out of his money. I told him that he would be back one day. Instead of saying all of that, the Bible records, and we just read it, that he ran out to the son. To go and meet him. And this morning I believe that God is saying to somebody. You're still my baby. You still belong to me. And as a matter of fact I believe he's telling the devil. That one belongs to me. And notice. It was the father who ran to the son. And not the son who ran to the father. It was like he had been waiting. And he had been hoping. And he had been praying. That this day would one day come. And the Bible goes on to say that. That the father had a robe and he had a ring and he had a pair of sandals and he had a fattened calf ready just in case the son came back. And scholars will tell you exactly what each one signifies, right? The robe signifies authority. The ring signifies belonging. The sandals signify something else and the fattened calf belongs to something else. But it never says, the, the story that Jesus tells in this chapter, in chapter, Luke chapter 15, he gives three, three parables, three examples. And in this particular story, he never says how old the son was when the son left. The son could have been a teenager for all we know. Or he could have been a young man for all we know. It doesn't even say how far or how long he was gone for. Now my question to you this morning is, how, what kind of love does a father have to have to have a robe that would still fit the child just in case they came back? What kind of love does a father have to have to have a ring that would still fit his son or his child whenever they got back. What kind of father or what kind of love does a father have to have to where the sandals would still fit or the fan cap to be just fresh enough to be able to slaughter? To raise this fan cap from when it's a little cap, a little kid as they say, and to raise it up because this one right here belongs to me when he comes home. We can eat all the other ones, but this one right here, it's a sign to my child. What kind of love does a father have to have just in case his child comes back? And whoever this is for, listen to the words that I'm telling you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been gone. God has something that fits you right now. Amen. And this morning, God is running after you to come to bring you back to your seat at the table, and you have to come back right now. This is your call. Amen. For those of you who've gone to the bar and you stay down there till it closes, and they say it's the last call. <laughs> this could be the last call for somebody in this room. Amen. And before we go any further, I want you to know that there's nothing that you could do that could make God ever love you any less. Amen. Amen. God loves you so much. Let me say it like this. God loves you so much that he delayed me from preaching any other message so that when you got here, this message would be for you. For three weeks, God delayed me in this message and said, you will stay right here because I want them to know how much I love them. Oh, yes. I want them to know that they belong to me. I want them to know that all they have to do is repent and 
turn from their from their wicked way. All they have to do is repent and come to me. I want to I want to say it like this: God is running after you this morning. He's not waiting for you to get out of your pew and run to Him. He's running to you. You feel that conviction in your heart? That's the Holy Spirit. You know, if you were to go on to the next verse, the Bible says that there was a severe famine in the land and that, can I get the praise and worship team up here? That there was a severe famine in the land. And that that son who was the prodigal now found himself to be in want is the way the King James Version is. Some of you might be in a situation or in a position where you feel like you're in want or you're in need. And what if I was to tell you that God allowed that place to, to occur in your life because he wants you to turn back to him so bad and to come back. Because he's waiting for you with loving arms and open arms and he's got a robe and he's got a ring and he's got sandals that are only a sign to you. He's got a fat and calf to celebrate. You know when he, when the prodigal son came back he, he actually says about this, he says, man, this is my son who was once lost, but he's now found. This is my son who was once dead, but he's alive again. He was expressing how he felt in the absence of his son. And a lot of preachers will tell you, well, the other son got upset. The other son got upset, but he also got his inheritance, if you, if you pay attention to what we read. The Bible says that the father divided up the inheritance to both. But this morning, regardless of which one you are, whether you're the prodigal, or whether you're the son that's still in church, I want you to know that the father has a love for you. And like he told his, the other son, what we have here, it, it's always belonged to you. It was always yours. But do you understand, son, that this child, we need to celebrate because they've come back. There is something about repentance that brings joy to the father's heart. There is something about when we surrender our own pride and our own egos, and it brings joy to the Father to the point where he wants to celebrate. And like I said a moment ago, the Father has something in store for you that fits only you. And he's waiting for you to come back to him. Amen. And this morning is that morning Amen. where God is calling you back to him. What I want to do is I want to open up an altar or this altar. And I want to give you an opportunity to come and love the Father. And allow him to love on you. You see, we can sit here and we can pray the most beautiful prayers. We can lay hands on you. But in reality, it means nothing without the love of the Father. Yeah. And I want to invite you to this altar. In spite of the bondages. In spite of the addictions. In spite of the sin. In spite of the feeling of unworthiness. I want to invite you to this altar because I'm telling you that there is a father who's doing this right now in heaven. Is that my baby? Could that be my baby? That baby, you're still my baby. You still belong to me. Devil, get your filthy hands off of my child because that one belongs to me. That one is my child. Those of you who are parents, you know, you know an idea of the love that I'm speaking of. But I want you to know that the love that I'm speaking of it's even more than you and I could ever fathom, even more than you and I could ever conceive or comprehend. The love that the Father has for you is that he sent his one good kid and sacrificed him for all of us sinners. Even when we didn't know him, even when we didn't confess him as our Lord and Savior, that's the love that he has for you. Some people would call that an obsession. Others would call that crazy love. Others would call that reckless love. But he loves you that much. In spite of how your earthly parents feel about you, in spite of how this world feels about you, God loves you that much. And this morning, I want to invite you to this altar. Because I believe that this is a divine appointment from the beginning of the service until this moment right now. God has been speaking to the hearts of somebody in this room. And I say, come to the altar. In spite of your sin, come to the altar in spite of your circumstance. Come to the altar in spite of your situation and give it to God. Give it to the Father who has a place safe for you at his table. This altar is not open. Would the rest of you please stand to your feet and begin to worship and begin to pray for the souls that are coming up here to this altar.